everybody. <laughs> I don't think we actually would need the microphones, but it's good for the recording. So, um, hello, thank you for coming. My name is Gianluca, and uh, I'm going to moderate the introduction and introduce our speaker. So, uh, our event today, How Much is Too Much? Substance Abuse and Addiction in Young Adulthood. And um, we have a speaker that is, I think, more than qualified to talk about this topic and uh, give us some insights. Uh, his name is Borges Quedner. He uh, studied uh, psychology and uh, pharmacy at the University of Bonn. And um, he did his dissertation uh, with consequences related to ecstasy at the Ruhr University of Bochum and worked as a research assistant uh, also at the University of Bonn. Uh, now he's associate professor at, for experimental and clinical pharmacopsychology at the Department of Psychiatry, Pra Psychotherapy and Psychosomatics of the Psychiatric University Hospital Zurich. <laughs> Very focused on the psyche. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh, his main research interests are behavioral neurotoxicology and neuroplasticity of substance use as well as the neuropsychopharmacology of disturbed brain function in psychiatric disorders, particularly schizophrenia and addiction. So. This is one of his main fields, addiction. Um, yeah, without further ado, uh, give you the stage. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the introduction and also for the invitation to this interesting um, event. Uh, first of all, I would like to say um, the topic I speak about today is not, uh, let's say, at, at the heart of my daily research business. Um, as it uh, was said before, I'm more interested uh, directly on the neurobiological and neuropsychological consequences of drug use. So we try to understand what, uh, um, what changes if somebody uses chronically substances. Yeah? What changes in the brain, what changes in emotions, in cognitions, and in the social behavior of subjects. However, today I give you a talk which more broadly uh, introduces and, and um, yeah, uh, describes addiction as a phenomenon, also for you to help yeah, to justify your own substance use um, or to, to, to weight your own uh, substance use or the substance use of your environment a bit better. So first of all, the United Nations estimate that, um, that's not surprising, that cannabis is still the, um, the most common used illegal drug in the world. For sure, the most common non-illegal uh, non would be alcohol and tobacco. But from the, from the illegal part, at least in most of the world, um, cannabis is still the lead, uh, followed by opioids, amphetamines, cocaine and then ecstasy. The picture in Switzerland and in Europe I will describe a bit later that's slightly different but um, yeah we come to this um, some minutes later. And as you see here um, I already already said this um, the drugs are not everywhere the same that are at least most frequently used. So Europe is a typical cocaine amphetamine and cannabis market, while other uh, regions of the world like the US, US has become uh, 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 or has developed a epidemic opioid use. So first, um, they, the, the use of prescription opioids has risen and as a consequence later, they got a new heroin wave. But this is not the case, at least so far in Europe. And also there are some, some other um, uh, regions like the Far East, where sometimes completely different drugs play a huge role, which are not that a problem, for example, in Switzerland or the rest of Europe, like ketamine. Yeah? So if we look for uh, drug use epidemiology, we always have to look for the region where we, uh, which is targeted. Um, in fact, so substance use matters specifically if a substance use disorder or a dependence 
has developed. So uh, it is estimated uh, that um, the substance use disorders belong to the top 20 of the leading causes of global burden of disease. Um, so in females, uh, drug use disorders um, are placed at the uh, uh, rank of 18th, um, and this is uh, far higher in the males. So this already give, gives us a glimpse that drug use may be primarily a male problem, but we come to that later again. So how is the situation in Europe in general? So also in Europe, cannabis is the most common used drug. It, it is estimated that there are about 20 or a bit more million users that have used cannabis at least once uh, in the last year. So that's one estimator of, of drug use for the uh, European Union and the last year prevalence. Um, this rate is higher in young adults. Yeah, you know, drugs are more used by young people and um, the, the prevalence is uh, at least twice as high as in the uh, uh, full age range. Uh, here we have a, a last year prevalence of about 15 to 16 percent of the young adults, of the youth and young adults that have used cannabis at least once uh, in the last year. Um, the second drug actually in Europe, and this is different to the global perspective, is already cocaine, uh, followed by MDMA and amphetamines. And if you look at the prevalence rates, they are uh, far lower than, uh, for, for example, cannabis use. Um, how is the situation in Switzerland? Uh, in Europe, there we have a kind of yearly monitoring across um, the European countries uh, in the uh, EU. Um, not every country in the EU uh, monitors substance use uh, on an on a, uh, annual base, but um, so uh, there is at least an annual drug report um, by the EMCDDA, the European um, Behörde, yeah, the, the U European agency who's monitoring drug use in the e EU. So, but the, the Switzerland does not take part in this EU project of drug monitoring. So we have to look wh what are the governmental numbers in Switzerland published. And uh, interestingly, the last numbers published, official numbers, are from 2016, so they are pretty old. Um, and interestingly, if you look here for cannabis use, the, the, um, um, the cannabis last year prevalence is more or less comparable with the numbers from the last year in the EU. Um, eight years ago, it was a bit higher than in the EU, but cannabis ha uh, use has risen in the last 10 to 15 years uh, in, the, in, 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 in Europe. But if you look for the cocaine numbers, amphetamine, MDMA, maybe I go uh, uh, back a bit, then the numbers are lower. Yeah? At least um, the numbers um, um, estimated by the uh, Ministry of Health in Switzerland. I have to say this, uh, these are numbers um, from a telephone interview. So from a randomized telephone interview, you might, uh, might been, uh, have chosen a call center is uh, calling you and you are asked for your substance use by an unknown person uh, at the telephone. So how reliable uh, are these numbers? Um, and actually most uh, addiction experts from Switzerland, they are in doubt that these numbers are true. And um, there were investigations of wastewater. You may have heard this. And if we are looking for the wastewater, Swiss cities are amongst the highest in entire Europe. And this is, um, by the way, 
also the case um, for MDMA. So that this, these are uh, even uh, newer numbers. What you also see that MDMA use has strongly risen. So in, in the late uh, two, 2010 years. Uh, so these numbers suggest that uh, likely the drug use is not below the European average that uh, uh, what uh, the numbers of the uh, um, Ministry of Health has, has uh, suggested. In fact, we did a study here in Zurich. Um, now, four years ago, we asked 1,220-year-old people who participated in a, a longitudinal cohort study, the ZPROSO study, and we asked them also for the last year prevalence of drug use. And what you see here is very high numbers, unexpectedly high numbers. If this would work, yeah, yeah. You see that he, in this survey, almost 60% said that they have used cannabis at least once in the last year. Um, more than 10% used ecstasy and cocaine. And um, also opioids, uh, you know, opi opioids are drugs of higher harm potential. Uh, codeine, so cough uh, a medication, which is sold in Switzerland uh, for free in pharmacies, so without prescription. Um, uh, more than 10% and even opioid painkillers, almost 5%. And these numbers, we were very surprised, maybe you, the younger generation is less surprised, but these numbers um, um, were, were uh, surprisingly high for us. If we look for gender differences, so usually I, I, I said the, the perspective of an addiction uh, psychologist like me is, yeah, um, men use more drugs and they use more severe, uh, or they have more severe drug use patterns. But if we look here, in fact, men are using more, though they have a higher prevalence rate. But the gap between the sexes is far lower than expected. So also um, ecstasy is using, uh, 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 um, uh, was used by uh, about 10% of the females. Uh, also cocaine was used by about 8% of the females. This was also surprising for us. There are uh, some uh, drugs where no significant um, uh, difference was was uh, observed, but uh, or there were also drugs like like opiate painkillers, where females had a higher prevalence than males. So um, this was really uh, unexpected for us. We have also asked the people uh, when they started drug use. So the, what we call the age of onset of drug use. And um, for cannabis, this is pretty early in, in Zurich. Um, the median is between 15 and 16. So that means half of the people of the cannabis users started their cannabis use before the age of 15 and a half. And the other half later, at least in a, in a cohort of 20 year old. Um, you see that cocaine and um, MDMA and also amphetamines, they, they, um, the use is started later. So the median is here uh, 18. But again, who used this, these drugs started, um, the half of them started before the age of 18. Yeah. Um, Hallucinogens are, uh, have an even higher uh, median age of onset. And for opioids and benzodiazepines, it's quite different. It's, um, these drugs were in this generation not that common. I think the, the young generation who is now between 15 and 20, they would have a, a earlier age of onset specifically for benzodiazepines because, uh, for example, Xanax is very... Um, hip at the moment in, in uh, uh, young students. So what we did on top in this study is we collected hair samples. 
You know, self-reports of drug use in a questionnaire, even in a longitudinal cohort study, um, where the people are very familiar with the study personnel and so on, it was not clear how reliable these self-reports are. Therefore, we used, uh, in collaboration here with the um, a toxicological, uh, the f a forensic uh, toxicologist, um, hair analysis to estimate that. And we used three centimeters, and three centimeters reflect three months of drug use, so a quarter of a year, about. We also asked on top, again, the use of drugs in the last three months, and we compared both numbers and here we are. So one problem um, that arises is you can detect THC in the hair but only at very high concentrations. So um, in contrast to stimulant drugs or opioids or also benzodiazepines and many um, um, uh, psychiatric drugs for example uh, where we sometimes can detect single uses in three months. Yeah? This is not possible with cannabis. Cannabis use can only be detected if it is somewhere between weekly and daily use. So several times a week likely also induces a positive test here. If you only use it once a week um, or, or less, we will not see it in the hair. So th therefore, the right, uh, the, the left side here, uh, we have the self-report of weekly or daily cannabis use. It's about um, uh, eighteen percent, and the the positive um, um, THC positive hair samples were around fourteen percent. So the daily users, they they the self-report is a bit, little bit lower, about eleven to twelve percent, and you see. This reflects more or less well what we already have known that, yeah, um, we can we can detect weekly to daily use with with this method, and the the numbers are quite reliable. So if you are using cannabis, the people were likely they 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 told us the truth, but if we look uh, for ecstasy and cocaine, also codeine the hair numbers were higher, about 30 to 40 percent across the drugs. Yeah? So the, the self-report underestimated the true drug use in, the, in this sample. So again, in this, this means in, in this cohort here of 1,020-year-olds from a representative cohort study that 12 percent have used ecstasy in the last three months and almost 10% cocaine in the last three months. And this is an incredible number for an addiction psychologist like me, because if we think back to the official numbers, this is far, far, far more. Yeah, maybe not surprising you, because you observe your, 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 um, your uh, environment likely very um, with high attention. Um, but for us, this was really... Um, not expected. So, looking again for gender differences, I, I make it short here, um, the difference between self-report and objective measurement is um, less, usually less in females than in males. So, either females told, m told us more the true consumption or they had a better memory. Yeah, we don't know. But um, that's interesting. So the, the bias was lower in, in females. So what we see in these um, hair samples and what is also known that most of the drug users use it in a controlled way. Most of the drug users who use drugs regularly will not become, become addicted or dependent in their life. And the holy grail of addiction research is who is becoming dependent. So why 
start people using drugs and why get some of the people in the end addicted and others not. Yeah? What we know, and this is a new, let's say, um, perspective on, on substance use that yeah, is now developing more and more in this um, uh, addiction research area is that we look on substance use as, a, um, as instrumental use. So people use these drugs for specific purposes. And these purposes are usually, at least in the beginning, positive for the, for the persons, yeah? for, the, for the affected indi individuals. I, here are different motives or um, instrumentalizations of drug use that, is list, that are listed. So the most common is likely feeling better in any way or getting high is maybe an extreme here, but just feeling better. Maybe some uh, use drugs also for cognitive enhancement, uh, specifically stimulant drugs, um, or for vigilance uh, enhancement and counteracting fat fatigue. Cannabis is not so ideal here, alcohol as well, but again, stimulants are the drugs uh, used for this. Um, improvement of social interaction, uh, facilitating sexual contact. So you are in the Ausgang and you use drugs maybe to, to uh, get to know a partner, for example. Um, enhancement of physical attractiveness, that's what the authors listed. I never understood it actually, what they meant. Do they mean I'm more attractive or do they mean the other one gets maybe less unattractive by the drug use? I don't know. Um, then also an uh, important um, motive is curi simply curiosity and sensation seeking seeking new experiences, or also coping with physical and psychological stress. And finally, another facet of that self-medication of psychiatric symptoms. So what is now, how, do a, how does a psychiatrist define drug dependence or substance dependence or substance addiction? So we um, many people use these both terms in German, Abhängigkeit und Sucht, yeah, in English, dependence and addiction. Uh, they use these uh, terms as synonyms. Synony synonym, yeah, so synony um, yeah, vice versa in a way. <laughs> um, but uh, in fact, drug dependence means physical dependence. So if the body gets dependent. Um, that means that the drug is, if you use it chronically, once necessary for normal functionism, uh, function of the organism. Um, these drugs usually also develop tolerance. And um, if the drug is not uh, longer in the body, withdrawal symptoms arise. Um, and interestingly, also non-psychoactive drugs or non-drugs that do not produce a high uh, can induce dependence like antidepressants. Yeah? This would also be the case for uh, uh, several uh, uh, psychiatric medications. Um, here we know alcohol, nicotine, all opioids, benzodiazepines, barbiturates, GHB, liquid ecstasy, um, they all can induce a physical dependence. Uh, in contrast, drug addiction or Sucht uh, usually means psychological dependence. And then here you, can, you might think, um, okay, okay, this is easier, this is less severe, but this is in fact not the case. Um, here, uh, a major factor is the motivational strength of, of the substance. And um, this results in the end in, in a compulsive uh, relapsing drug use despite the knowledge of negative consequences and although there is no physical dependence. And this is usually triggered by craving, uh, craving symptoms, so the urge to use a drug in response to contextual cues. So it's a learning mechanism. Yeah? The, you get conditioned on the drug. And these are usually uh, all stimulants, including cocaine and amphetamines. K 
cannabis is not so clear if it belongs to the first or the second class. And for ecstasy and hallucinogens, um, we are, there, are, there are experts uh, saying there is no addiction from these substances. And uh, actually in, um, in psychiatric care, these substances do not play a big role. Yeah, very little, a very low number of people uh, seeks help because of only MDMA addiction or only hallucinogen addiction. So these are substances of at least low addictive power. Interestingly, um, there is in the new um, um, classification criteria uh, published by the American Association of Psychiatrists, they drop both terms. Yeah, they say we don't speak longer about addiction, we don't speak longer about dependence, it's all substance use disorder. And we drop these um, uh, names for anti-stigmatization reasons. They also say don't use abuse or misuse of drugs anymore, this is all stigmatizing, just uh, uh, speak about use of drugs. However, um, when we look so to um, for the classification criteria um, of the WHO for drug dependence, then um, you see this is um, there are six criteria, and these criteria have to be fulfilled for a certain time period during one year. Yeah? They should at least uh, okay, they should occur together um, within the last 12 months. And if you, have, uh, if you fulfill more than three criteria, then you get the diagnosis of dependence. And you see, um, this can be compulsive drug use, uh, difficulties in control uh, substance taking, withdrawal signs, tolerance, um, neglect of, of alternative pleasures of interest, also neglect of social uh, contacts, for example, um, and using the drug despite the known negative consequences and so on. So three of them would be enough to fulfill the criteria of drug dependence. So what you also see is, is, is a purely phenomenological um, diagnosis. Yeah? We don't have any biomarker, any biological test, any medical imaging technique that informs us if somebody has an addiction, depends or whatsoever or not. Um, as I said, the uh, American uh, Psychiatric Association, they have a different approach now. They say we are just speaking about a substance use disorder and this can be um, light, moderate or severe. They have 11 criteria and um, they say if you fulfill at least um, two of them in a given year, then you have then you start already with a light substance use disorder. So what previ previously was meant as abuse, for example, would be now termed um, as a light uh, substance use disorder and a, a severe substance use disorder likely is more or less the same like a dependence um, a diagnosis uh, earlier. So um, the addictive potential of drugs is not the same across the drugs. So there are drugs with a high addictive potential and drugs with a low addictive potential. And the most addictive substance that we know is nicotine. Yeah, so we know that about one third of the smokers get uh, a, a nicotine use this or a nicotine dependence as you uh, like um, uh, once in, li in the lifetime. Yeah, one third will develop um, um, uh, uh, nicotine dependence. Heroin, it's about one quarter of the users. It's not every user, as maybe your mother and father have told you. If you once take heroin, you are dependent for the rest of your life. That's not true. 
But the number is high. Yeah, A quarter is still high. And this is also true for cocaine and also methamphetamine, uh, with, which is not included here. But these stimulants also have a high addictive potential. For cocaine, it's estimated between 15 and 22 percent of the people um, who uh, uh, will develop cocaine dependence um, during lifetime. And actually, cocaine and also methamphetamine um, are the drugs with the fastest development of de uh, dependence. So five to six percent of the users develop dependence already in the first year of use. This is far more um, than, for example, for alcohol. <coughs> Most other drugs, actually, they have a risk of about 10%. So one in 10 users will develop a problem with this. This is true for cannabis, at least for, uh, for the total age, age range. This is true for alcohol, for stimulants other than cocaine, so methylphenidate, ritalin, or amphetamine. Um, also for anxiolytic drugs like benzodiazepines and so on. Um, what's also... A uh, difference between drug is the harm that is caused by the drugs. And here you, you see a listing which differentiates between harm to yourself, if you take the drug, and harm to your social environment. And here the most harming drug is alcohol. Yeah? For sure this is, has something to do with the frequency of use or with the availability of the drug. There's a question. Actually, this is a de that's a very good question. This is a Delphi survey in um, addiction experts. Yeah? For example, um, in UK addiction um, uh, experts. The UK addiction um, experts say that ecstasy has a very low risk. I wouldn't agree here. Yeah? I did a lot of research with uh, ecstasy users. And I wouldn't place it on top, but I wouldn't also place it as low as placed here. Yeah? Um, but this is just the opinion. This is not based on uh, empirical facts, let's say. Yeah? Nevertheless, I think this, this reflects which drugs are at the moment a problem in, uh, in psychiatry. Yeah? How many users do they see and how hardly they are, are they... Uh, affected. affected. Um, there's another factor modulating the addiction risk, it's age. And uh, the problem is that especially young people are at higher risk of getting addicted. Yeah, this, is, this graph shows the uh, percent of uh, each age group uh, with the first time depends, and you see between 15 and 25, the risk is much higher than during the rest of the life. Um, this also contributes to the fact that, for example, um, teenage cannabis users have a higher risk, a much higher risk, than adult cannabis users. Um, and this is, um, again, elevated in daily users and if then if you then um, think about that there are many daily teenage cannabis users they have the highest risk you can you can you can imagine yeah so there are moderators of the addictive potential another problem is that early substance use um, and this is a, a very good uh, um, uh, or a very elaborated study, a national multi cohort study with more than 5,000 people. Um, they looked for um, signs of substance use disorder uh, during adolescence and in later life. It's a longitudinal study. And they uh, clearly showed that um, Young people using, for example, medical prescription drugs like methylphenidate or uh, opioid painkillers um, or which show any kind of substance use disorder symptoms already in adolescence, they have a much higher risk in later life to develop a full or a more severe substance use disorder. Um, this is, has also been shown 
uh, specifically for cannabis use disorder. This is interesting because these were already adult users um, and they were um, investigated twice uh, with an interval of four to five years. And cannabis users at the first um, measurement had a six-fold increased risk suffering from any kind of substance use disorder five to six years later. So it doesn't matter if so most of them developed uh, cannabis use disorders. The risk was about 10, tenfold. But you have also elevated risk, for example, to develop alcohol use disorder. So the, 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 you, all, you may have heard from um, the problem um, of, or from the concept of a gateway drug. This has now um, a made an evolution in that way that we don't think that somebody who starts uh, using cannabis is using heroin once later. Yeah, so that's not true in that way. But uh, um, from the epidemiological standpoint, um, we know that many users of one drug start to use other drugs later in life. But it's the it's not a a linear relationship, but they obviously learn to instrumentalize one drug and this elevates the risk to learn also the, the, the effects of other drugs, drugs or uh, this is lowering the, um, um, the threshold to use other drugs, likely. Yeah, there are other risk factors for drug addiction, and usually we, we look um, uh, at the biological um, uh, layer, uh, on the genetic layer. There seemed to be a genetic contribution to addiction. It's not that big compared to other psychiatric disorders. Um, there is, uh, and we know that there is this very strong environmental uh, uh, um, influence on and drug addiction. So how early you use, um, uh, how the availab av availability of a drug is, how the cost of drugs is, and if you are affected by any kind of psychiatric problems, for example, childhood trauma uh, or ch uh, chaotic home uh, um, situations and um, child abuse and so on. Um, but also parents' use, parents' attitudes, peer influences, and so on. We know that this is all a big impact on drug use. Um, there are different uh, theories how um, drug use uh, usually develops. And this is a very influential one, the opponent process theory. Um, however, this is likely... Um, more theory um, targeting um, drugs inducing physical dependence. Yeah? A good explanation is simply nicotine. So usually somebody uses a drug for having a positive effective state. Ah, ich einen Pointer. So, um, so the drug induces a positive effective state and uh, once the, the drug effect um, fades out. Sometimes you get a slightly negative effect afterwards, a kata or a, a withdrawal symptom on the next day, um, um, or sometimes also not. So if you start using the drug more and more and more and more, um, the positive effects are diminished more and more, and the negative effects are increased. And there is one point where you simply use a drug to diminish negative effects and where you more or less have no positive effects anymore. And again, smoking is a good, uh, um, uh, smoking is a good example here. Most severe smokers don't smoke for pleasure anymore. Usually they don't like smoking anymore, but they have to smoke because if they are not smoking, they are... Uh, um, coming into an, a very unpleasurable, uh, negative, effective state. Yeah? So they have to smoke to um, decrease this negative uh, uh, effect. Um, however, this is, for example, not that 
uh, well explaining stimulant addiction. Yeah? In stimulant addiction, you usually don't have these long-term negative effects. Um, you have the crash, for example. Um, in cocaine use, if you have a, a binge use experience of cocaine, if you're using several grams on one weekend, um, a line after a line, and then you are stopping cocaine, then you can develop very strong negative uh, effects. But if they are once away, after some hours, usually, um, then there is no negative effective state anymore. Yeah? Um, therefore, um, another uh, theory has developed, the incentive sensitization mod model. And this model is interesting. It is based on the, um, on the model before, but it uh, differentiates two states, the wanting state and the liking state. Yeah, I want a drug and I like a drug. And that's, again, for smoking, interesting, because smoking, if, if you develop uh, um, dependence, you don't like the drug anymore so, so much, but you want it more and more. And they said wanting is mediated by the neurotransmitter dopamine, and liking is mainly mediated by the uh, um, endogenous uh, opioid sy system, and they also tried in animal models to separate specific hotspots in the reward system for wa for wanting and liking. And this was very interesting. However, in in humans, it is very hard to really differentiate wanting and liking. Yeah, to really measure wanting and liking. We tried that once, but. Yeah, I can tell you it's not that easy. Um, another influential uh, theory is um, coming from uh, Nora Volko and colleagues um, because they focus on another aspect of addiction. They clearly focus or they, they clearly conceptualize addiction at the form of pathological learning and memory. They say, usually if I, I start using a drug, um, I have uh, control over my drug use and the, the reward of the drug and the drive to take the drug is not that big. And um, I, I, if I once uh, have taken the drug, I have also a memory of the drug effect. Um, however, if I use the drug more and more, um, the reward of the drug and the drive to seek this reward gets more and more important. The memory on the drug effect gets more and more important, but the control uh, gets weakened more and more. And she said, so control are usually associated with the functions of the prefrontal cortex, um, the motivational, uh, motivation and the drive to use the drug uh, are associated with the orbitofrontal uh, cortex and learning and memory with uh, the hippocampus and the amygdala and reward and salience with the nucleus accumbens or the, the, the core um, uh, structures of the human reward system. Um, she later um, also differentiated um, different stages so the, the, the first, we have the positive reinforcement of the drug, and this is mainly mediated by the activation of the reward system by dopamine and also endogenous opioids. Um, and in this stage, a stimulus, a stimulus response habit learning is enhanced. That means also, if I, for example, take cocaine, then the environment gets more and more important for me and is associated with the drug use. Um, this is um, what we uh, uh, think is associative learning of the context cues, and this later plays an important role um, for relapse. Then we have the withdrawal state or the negative effect state, um, where uh, other brain structures like the amygdala uh, are getting important. This is uh, inducing stress, which again is... Um, um, associated with the activity of the um, 
HPA axis, so with the cortisol release, for example, or the uh, adrenaline release, and also some opioids which have uh, which are mediating negative uh, affective states like dunorphine. Um, in this um, stage, you should have reduced endogenous opioids, and this leads to a kind of negative reinforcement. So again, like in the uh, opponent process theory, I'm seeking the drug um, to avoid these negative symptoms. And finally, um, and this is likely most uh, mostly true for, for the stimulant drugs, um, if I'm now getting into an, uh, in, uh, an environment where I usually use a drug, for example, I'm using the drug already in the Zukunft, in the club. Yeah? Not I, as an example. Yeah? I, never, I, I haven't been there for a long time, actually. <laughs> um, and then um, this context association um, activates uh, uh, the memory system, the drug memory, and now the organism is expecting a drug effect. And if this drug effect is not coming, withdrawal symptoms or the urge to use the drug is getting stronger and stronger. And at that stage, disrupted prefrontal control is important. So I can't handle this impulse to use the drug anymore, so I can't control it anymore, and I start use, uh, using the drug again. And this is um, yeah, the, the, the learning model of, of drug use. Um, yeah, and another influential theory which is embedded in, in, the, in the Volko uh, stuff is um, the dopamine uh, hypothesis. So we know that more or less every drug increases dopamine in the reward system. This has been shown in, in animal studies at least. Also nicotine, which is not, which has not a directly dopaminergic uh, effect. It doesn't target dopamine transporters or dopamine receptors, but nevertheless, in the end, it uh, uh, rele the, uh, uh, dopamine is released in the nucleus accumbens, um, and it has also been shown that um, in humans with PET studies, that if I uh, um, give a, a, a drug and I label um, structures uh, of the reward uh, system with uh, radio traces, for example, then I can clearly show that the, the subjective feeling of a high is uh, associated with a stronger occupancy of, for example, dopamine receptors in the striatum. So dopamine plays a very strong role. Um, however, um, this dopamine hypothesis in humans has been challenged um, because there are PET studies showing that dopamine is released in the stri striatum um, and others not. For example, stimulants, nicotine and alcohol, but not cannabis and opioids trigger at least in measurable dopamine responses in the human ventral striatum. So um, likely also other neurotransmitters are needed to, um, to develop addiction in a way. There is also a famous glutamate hypothesis now, uh, which, which is getting more and more influential. So uh, we are getting a bit away from seeing uh, addiction only as a dopaminergic problem. So what, what can you do if somebody has developed a substance use disorder? Um, and first of all, we have to see that all substance use disorders are chronic relapsing disorders. Yeah? Cure is hard to achieve in these disorders. Yeah? That it's normal that people with severe substance use disorders at least experience relapses. Yeah? You shouldn't be disappointed if somebody is, um, is in therapy and then comes, okay, I have used the drug again. That's in a way, normal. So, um, the, the, the goal of a, a, a therapy of a substance use disorder is, the first goal is ensuring, ensuring survival. Because many drugs 
are life-threatening, for example, opioids. And the first goal is how can we achieve that this person survive the next weeks or months? Um, then you start to, to treat secondary or uh, uh, concomitant diseases. You try to increase the quality of life, also the social quality of life uh, with, the, with these peoples. Uh, you um, try to increase the insight of the disease and the, the motivation of change because many people who are starting a drug use therapy are not that motivated because the, the partner or the family says, okay, you are now going to, to a therapy because um, otherwise we get a problem with you. The, the motivation is often not that high and the therapist has to start to increase this motivation. Um, then um, you can start to, to establish more and more substance-free phases um, um, to improve the psychosocial situation, so to solve, for example, social problems with, with the patient. And the final, final, final goal is in the end abstinence. But this is really the latest goal. Um, so the backbone of each therapy is um, psychotherapy because um, for most of the drug there is no pharmacotherapy so far. There are no approved substances. There are some substances substances are given uh, off-label, but um, for most of the substances, approved, sub uh, uh, approved medication is not available yet. Um, then social reintegration plays a, a big role and also harm reduction. So what can I do that, that um, um, the, the patient does not affect the, the, the own health uh, as much as possible or as, as less as possible, as I said. Yeah, in the end, we have five minutes left. Um, there is, you know, there is a, a big debate also in Switzerland at the moment about uh, legalization of, of drug use. And this is an example for cannabis legal, legalization in the world. So the... Um, the orange or uh, red uh, colored countries, they have already uh, legalized. Actually, North Korea is, uh, is lacking here. North Korea has no uh, rule on, on cannabis uh, consumption. Um, and in the green countries, medical cannabis use is allowed. And this is also true, for example, in Switzerland. Uh, in the US, uh, um, the situation is a bit uh, complicated at the moment. There are um, uh, states who already have legalized the drug. Uh, some have only legalized the, medi uh, the medical drug use and there are still some uh, states which have not legalized the drug. Interestingly, in the last Monitoring the Future study, this is a very, very big longitudinal study in the uh, United States um, or a daily study, it's uh, not an age cohort, and they um, uh, showed in a, in a press release some month ago that uh, drug use or the cannabis use is a, has reached an all-time high in the last year in the U.S., specifically in young adults. Um, and the authors of this uh, research report uh, made mainly the legalization um, of cannabis responsible for that uh, effect. Um, there is also a recent uh, systematic review uh, of Isona et, uh, et al. And he nicely summarizes what we know about the after effects of legalization in Canada and in the US. And th what they um, conclude is, so we know that legalization uh, leads to a decrease in the price of the substance. Uh, in a higher exposition of THC, this is only true for states or regions where also edibles are allowed. So edibles are, for example, um, THC-containing fluids which can be uh, vaped. Um, there are states only legalizing a, a grass, so wheat, the, 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 the plant itself, but not allowing, for example, uh, food with THC. 
Um, but where these edibles are allowed, so the, the, the famous uh, THC uh, gummy bärchen, which are existing, um, there the, the, the people are more exposed to higher levels of, uh, or they're, they're exposed to higher levels of THC. Then there is a greater diversity of presentations for consumption, like vaping and, and uh, ingesting, in a way, uh, THC-containing um, products. There is, a, in fact, a lower risk perception and an increase in consumption in adults and adolescents. Um, interestingly, even if it's still illegal for the adolescents, the, the consumption has increased. And there's um, an increase in adverse consequences derived from, from cannabis consumption on public health. And once is, for example, an increase in, in uh, traffic accidents uh, associated with, with cannabis use. Um, one positive uh, side is that there is a decrease in drug-related arrests. Um, but interestingly, in most of the states, the black market still exists. That is always the hope in legalization that they think, okay, we, the, the black market induces so much problems and with legalization, these problems diminish. That's obviously not true, at least not yet. Um, there was so far no increase in the demand for treatment for cannabis um, use disorder, for example, but there is at least one study showing that the number of cannabis use disorders has, has uh, risen in, in, in one state. But I think we have to, because it takes years to develop this, uh, this kind of disorder, um, it's likely too early to, to really um, conclude on that. So the, 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 these authors at least concluded that these legislative changes have so far failed to achieve most of the main objective, objectives, so like suppressing the illegal market and to protect the most vulnerable groups like the adolescents. But they also admit that it's likely too early to finally conclude on this problem. Um, yeah, I already said traffic uh, car crashes with injury, also fatal crash rates have increased about uh, four to five or four, four to six percent in several states. That was my presentation so far. Um, if you are seeking help, if you recommend something, uh, somebody um, uh, who might develop a problem, these are some um, um, th some websites who um, can guide you to, to uh, find the right uh, institution or the right person that uh, might help you. Also, um, drug checking is important um, because you know the drugs on the street are not pure. Yeah, they some um, pose some risks. And we have a, a, a working, a, um, a well-working drug checking also here in Zurich, the DITS, the Drug Information Center. And there are also uh, substance warnings uh, for substances or, for example, ecstasy pills with very high doses of MDMA or uh, drugs uh, included that shouldn't be included. So um, just for your information, you can use these links. Thank you for your information. And yeah, now one hour is over, but I think we have still some uh, time for questions, I think.